Tell Us How to Make It Better is partnering with The Readiness Lab, the home for podcasts, webinars, and training in the field of emergency and disaster services. I'm George Siegel, and this is the Tell Us How to Make It Better podcast. Every week, we introduce you to people who are working on real-world problems and providing actual solutions. Thank you for joining me today on the Tell Us How to Make a Better podcast. When I first recorded today's interview, I was calling the podcast Move the World. I've since changed the name, but if you hear references to Move the World, you will understand why. Now, the goal of this podcast is I want to introduce you to people that recognize that there are problems in the world and they're doing something to try and fix it. So it's very similar to what I was doing before. I just thought the name might bring more attention to what we're doing. So I hope you enjoy today's episode. My guest today is Ethan Brown, the founder and host of The Sweaty Penguin, a comedy environmental podcast presented by PBS National Climate Initiative, Peril and Promise, working to become a fresh, new Gen Z voice that makes environmental issues less overwhelming, less uh, politicized, and more fun. Ethan, welcome. Thanks for coming on. Oh, thanks for having me. Now, I think the, somewhat the answer to this is obvious, but tell me what you do that uh, moves the world? Well, I am, as you said, the founder and host of the Sweaty Penguin podcast. So uh, I've felt for a while that environmental issues can be a little too overwhelming and politicized sometimes. Uh, Because of that, I think it can be really difficult for people to engage with them, especially engaging with people who might disagree with them about uh, the political solutions to climate change. So I decided to start this podcast, use a combination of skills I had and skills my uh, colleagues have to uh, try to communicate these issues in a new and different way. Yeah, what I, what I enjoy about it, I've checked out some of your episodes, is, is you bring a sense of humor to it. And I think that's missing from some of the environmentalists that I feel are beating us over the head and, and are very angry if we don't agree with them. You seem to have a different approach. Yeah, I had a bit of experience as a comedy writer going back to high school when I worked for my high school satire publication. I ended up running it. And then in college, I uh, worked for my college satire publication, ended up running that one for two years. And I always, I mean, I've been a big fan of comedy. I've loved comedy. And so when I thought about how to make environmental issues a little more accessible and a little more easy for people to engage with, that was immediately where my mind went. And uh, so yeah, I know it's weird to think of climate change and comedy in the same sentence, but that's what we're doing. And I think we've uh, been able to put out something really different for people. Yeah, I mean, on one hand, it's not funny, but on the other hand, if it's funny, maybe people will pay attention to it. And, and that certainly seems what you bring to it. Now, what, what I also found interesting, a lot of people that I know that are in these environmentalists loved the outdoors growing up, yet in your bio, it says that you were not Mr. Outdoorsman. So what brought you around to this? Yeah, I was uh, probably the least outdoorsy kid growing up. I did not have hand-eye coordination till high school, maybe. Um, My mom would say I still don't have it. But I think I started getting interested in the environment because I was learning about climate change, maybe middle school, high school, and I was just scared. I thought it was... totally coming for me. I didn't want to see the world completely change in the future. And I just don't like hot weather. And so (laughs) I was really scared about it, but I couldn't get myself actively interested in it. I was, I even took a elective in high school on uh, climate change, environmental science, and I didn't like it. And so I felt like this is so important. At this point, I was uh, going to college for film and television, which I really enjoyed. And I felt like to tell stories as a storyteller, I need a story to tell and that the environment was a really important story to tell, but I had to make myself interested somehow. So that summer, I actually 
decided to start a little blog called The Sweaty Penguin. That was where it originated. Um, and I was doing kind of onion style environmental news headlines. Uh, so I would just make a satire of whatever environmental news was happening. And that was fun. I learned a lot, but people, it didn't work because people didn't get the jokes because they don't follow environmental news. <laughs> so I kind of put that on the back burner, went to college, decided to take a few, uh, a few more environmental courses and just kind of loosely pursue the environmental analysis and policy minor that Boston University offered uh, and just see if I could find something I liked. And that semester I did start to find some interesting stuff. I think what I really uh, grabbed onto was how the solutions to environmental issues can be really nuanced and they have a lot of pros and cons. It's not just the, we need to do this or we need to do that. Like we very often hear when it comes to environmental uh, solutions. And so I think that kind of reignited something in me. I started writing a lot more about environmental topics uh, from that framework of the, obviously the science and the facts are very, very clear about climate change and the threat it poses. Um, but the solutions you can really have a bit of fun and creativity with. So I started writing from that perspective, really enjoying it. And then come quarantine, I sort of put all of these different perspectives together, the comedy, the, um, the kind of solution variety, if you will, and started the Sweaty Penguin podcast, which I think has been the perfect culmination of all of this. Sure. How much thought went into that name? You know, it's, it's interesting when I, when I go to the zoo, I live in Florida. And when you see penguins in hot climates, I think of sweaty penguins. I did, did you think about the climate change? It's getting, earth is warming. So the penguins are sweating. I mean, how much thought went into that name? It was actually when I started that, uh, that blog, my dad thought of the name, the sweaty penguin, and we all loved it. And he's now said, you're free to use it. You can do whatever you want with it. Just make sure you always tell people that I was the one who thought of it. <laughs> so I, I am keeping that under the bargain. How'd you get hooked up with PBS? I mean, that seems like a good place for talking about uh, issues like this. Oh, uh, that's been a really cool partnership with, uh, PBS's uh, National Climate Initiative, Peril and Promise, which is housed in uh, WNET, the New York affiliate. So I had interned with them back in the summer of 2019. They have three uh, national multi-platform initiatives, uh, Peril and Promise, which covers climate change, Chasing the Dream, which covers poverty and opportunity in America, and Exploring Hate, which covers hate and extremism. And so I interned with them for a summer and really enjoyed working them. I kind of felt like I found my people, I found my place. And what they do is they partner with outside content creators to, um, they also do some stuff internally, but they partner with outside content creators to develop content for the initiatives and then they'll distribute it. And so when we were in quarantine, it was obviously very difficult uh, for getting content up. And at the same time, we were producing weekly episodes on climate change. So I reached out um, about a year in and I was like, hey, we're uh, doing this podcast. I think this is really up your alley. And we formed a partnership from there, which has been going great. And I'm actually uh, a production assistant with them as well as uh, doing the podcast with them. So I kind of have two hats now. Yeah, that's awesome. Our, our documentary film, The Last House Standing, aired on a lot of public television stations around the country. Um, and I know they have an audience that's very, uh, very receptive to that message. What are the biggest things you find when you introduce people to different areas of, of climate change issues and that reluctance to think that it, it matters or they can even make a difference? Because it's a daunting task. And, and, it, and when you look at it and somebody says, well, stop throwing this out or stop doing this or stop doing that, you think, well, if I'd stop, what difference is it going to make? I mean, how do you deal with that? I think there's a lot in there. I think what I've always done is never said this is the solution we have to take. 
I think I always present options to people and I present the pros and cons of those options. And I give people the agency to decide, oh, I like this policy. I don't like that policy, or I could see myself doing this action, but not that action. The way I see it, individual action for climate change is at its most effective when it's affecting community level change. So if we tell, if we start a solution with the premise, if everyone would just do blank, then we would fix something. It's just not gonna work because everyone isn't gonna adjust. So we need to figure out how do we inform people so they can make the decisions that fit for their life. Um, so I know you've talked on previous episodes here how there were some things that are great for the climate that you were already doing. And that's true for a lot of people, I think, because very often good uh, climate action is just being efficient, being smart, saving your money. Um, it's not too difficult when you think about it that way. Um, but there are other things like, for instance, I love steak. I don't see myself ever giving that up completely. Uh, maybe I'll say I'm not going to eat a really crappy steak. But um, yeah, I think if you try to expect everyone to do everything, that just becomes like a diet where you just can't stick to it and you fall apart. So I always advocate just making the decisions you can and then seeing where you can affect community level change, whether it's uh, telling people about those decisions in a non-condescending way or whether it's using your voice on a political level, on an activist level, even on the way I'm doing it, writing about issues, informing people. Uh, there's a lot of ways people can get involved. Well, anytime politics enters into it, you know, as we see, you're automatically throwing that divide up and, and half the people, it seems like, are going to say, no, nah, that's ridiculous. What a waste. We don't need to do that. The other half is going to say, oh, we absolutely have to do this. You know, I like to think, let's find things we can all agree on. In, in the podcast you were talking about, the woman who, who wrote the book, uh, Sandy Sturm, about things you can start doing. I mean, there was simple stuff in there, just being conscious of your leftovers, driving around a neighborhood to park, um, throwing stuff out rather than repurposing it. So there really are a lot of things you can do. So no matter what your politics are, it's just part of being a better citizen of the world, I guess you would say. Yeah, a, a lot of it really is just being smart. That's kind of what I say. Um, and also just doing some research. I think we forget how nuanced these things are and we think it has to just be a clear cut, uh, cut this out of my life type of thing where in reality, uh, for example, with uh, grocery bags, a paper bag takes about four times the climate impact of a single use plastic bag to make. And a tote bag is like 150 times the climate impact because of all that goes into growing cotton. So that's not to say single use plastic is good. It certainly isn't because it uh, really affects our oceans and marine life, but it's not so simple as these are bad and these other bags are good. Um, in fact, what I think a lot of experts are starting to like is the idea of some of those like thicker plastics that you can reuse a bit. Um, those don't quite have the same impact as a tote bag and, um, and you can reuse it. So that's nice. But I mean, tote bags can work. Just use it 150 times and you beat out the single use plastic. Um, but you don't want to have like eight tote bags in your closet. So there's a lot of this nuance that I don't think should be overwhelming. I think should be fun to learn about and kind of create that little puzzle for yourself. But you're right. It's really not, uh, not so difficult when you think about it. And it's not like there's any perfect way to live. So I think just doing what you can uh, makes a big difference. Yeah, I'm conflicted about what's good for me versus what's good for the environment. So I go to get a smoothie because I think it's good for me. And then they give me a paper straw mm -hmm. because that's good for the environment. But then I can't drink my smoothie because those straws are garbage. So it's like you have to pick your battle, right? I mean, I, I hate the paper straw. Oh, me too. I mean, we did a plastic straws episode and I think this is one that has been weirdly dividing 
I mean, I'm not surprised it's dividing. I'm surprised it's gotten so much attention. I think a lot of people are saying this isn't an issue at all. And a lot of people are saying this is like the poster child for environmentalism. And it's, it's somewhere in between there. Uh, the, there was a ocean cleanup. I forget the um, organization off the top of my head, but plastic straws and stirs were seventh on the list of items that they found in their ocean cleanup. So it's up there. It's not the number one thing. I think I was actually cigarette buds, surprisingly. Um, so when you consider like the plastic straw, the sea turtle's nose, there's only that one documented case of that happening. Maybe it's happened more, probably not, but certainly plastic straws do degrade. They put out microplastics. Uh, there's impacts like that. So that's not to say we have to get rid of plastic straws. In fact, I think quite the contrary, but we can think about things like, should the default at a restaurant be you order a drink and they bring out a straw with it? Or maybe should we have people ask if they want a straw? That kind of thing can reduce the consumption by a lot just by people not wanting the awkward interaction of asking for the straw. But obviously I think it should be totally fine if people want to drink with a straw. I personally am fine with just drinking with uh, no straw, but uh, if you like a straw, I see no problem with that either. And a lot of people a, need straws, which is important to consider as well. Yeah, I mean, it's a powerful image when they show all that garbage being pulled out of the ocean. When you see all that uh, garbage wash up, maybe a better campaign is to find all the assholes that throw that stuff out like that. I mean, that's just to me, we could put a stop to that just by being tougher on people that throw that ice, seeing people throw stuff out their car window. You see people toss stuff in parking lots. I mean, that's, that, that's a whole other issue is why are people throwing this stuff out? Not what are they throwing out? Yeah. I mean, litter is a tricky one because on the one hand, I think a lot of straws that end up in the ocean actually uh, were in a landfill and kind of got blown away by the wind because a lot of landfills are right next to the ocean. But um, certainly I think littering is a very easy thing uh, people can avoid. I mean, they have the little cubby in the car door. You can put, put it right there and then clean it out later. It's not too difficult. No, but smokers are the ones that drive me nuts. I mean, my wife and I used to leave... Uh, our, our kids diapers in ashtrays as a gift to smokers <laughs> the diaper bandit just because i say you're going to make us smell we'll give you a smell too uh because yep. they just toss those things on the ground I mean, you, know, you have workers at your house they're smoking outside they throw cigarette butts everywhere um that's annoying yeah no i i can see how that's frustrating for sure yeah so what would you find are the biggest environmental issues things that you've discovered that we really need to all collectively put our heads together and 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 try to figure out that's an interesting question i think part of what we try to do at the sweaty penguin is go off something a little more specific because i always say like we would never do an episode called climate change or deforestation or something like, like that's way too much to try to wrap your head around at once. So I try to take kind of bite-sized pieces and discuss them each week. I think obviously in the United States, a lot has been dominated by hurricanes and wildfires, hurricanes primarily on the East, wildfires in the West. Um, obviously those have other drivers such as uh, drought, such as flooding, all of that stuff. So these natural disasters are really a big part of why climate change is so scary. And what we're likely going to see even more in the future, we're already starting to see it, is what are called correlated extreme weather events, which are basically either two events that happen at the same time, that happen back to back, or that are happening concurrently in multiple areas of the country. So for example, we had I believe it was uh, hurricanes uh, Henry and Ida this year in 2021 that within a span of a few weeks uh, ended up reaching the Northeastern United States. And 
So what happens is Hurricane Henry hits, the soil is soaking wet from that, then Hurricane Ida hits, and it can't absorb any more of that moisture, so that ends up uh, eroding the soil, and that's just one teeny example of the uh, terrible stuff that happened with those hurricanes. But you can see how when two things happen so close together or in some other way are correlated, that has a big ripple effect. That's worse than just the sum of the two parts. So as climate change worsens, that kind of thing can become more frequent. And I think that's, uh, that's what's really scary to me. Yeah. And, and I think what's interesting, which we learned in the last house standing is a lot of times, and I've seen this for years, living in Florida, living in Texas, a storm comes towards you. They evacuate people that misses you and go somewhere else. So the next time people are less likely to evacuate because they don't think it's going to happen, but it's not even, you look at where the storms hit along the Gulf coast, but it, the Northeast got pummeled by Ida in places that have never flooded before, had record amounts of rain. So you really have to be on your guard wherever you are in the country, because just because the storm doesn't roll and hit you first doesn't mean you're not going to get the effects of it. Yeah, absolutely. And even if you're nowhere near the storm, it affects you economically very often. I mean, to think the um, amount of money we've spent on hurricane cleanups is in the trillions of dollars, um, just from government spending. So um, whenever people talk about this like environment versus economy uh, dichotomy, I really don't buy into that. And I don't find that to be true because on the one hand, we actually find a lot of environmental solutions also help the economy. Like I was talking about earlier, climate change is very often just about being efficient, being smart, using resources in a smart way, which also saves you money. Um, but then you take this next step and say, what if climate change got really bad? How much money would we be spending to clean it up? It's ridiculous. So um, I think that is very often where I try to reach people who might not be outdoorsy people interested in saving the planet, just like I wasn't growing up. Uh, but do care about their pocketbooks or maybe they care about their health or justice in their community or some other angle that um, I can present to them. Sure. I mean, it's an interesting angle. We talked about it on a previous podcast with a, a man who wrote a book about um, sustainable houses and why we need to build more sustainable houses. And he said, when it's the debris that's created from these garbage houses that are being built that end up all over the place, it's hundreds and millions of tons of stuff that gets thrown out. So I would think environmentalists would be very concerned. I mean, that's, that's a problem we have the solution for, but nobody wants to spend a little extra to do it. We actually just interviewed an expert on uh, sustainable housing. So I think that episode will come out in late winter, early spring, possibly. But I asked her about how, uh, the, how much... Uh, more input it takes to create a sustainable house versus just leaving up an existing house. I mean, you think about with cars, for example, it very often take is a smaller climate impact to drive your current car until you can't drive it anymore than it is to junk it and buy the new fancy electric car. So I could see the same thing being true of houses, of a lot of different things. I think using something to its full potential often has a lower climate impact and a lower uh, economic impact than getting the new thing, as exciting as that may be. Yeah, but people don't want to spend the money on it. They would rather redo the countertops in their kitchen or put up new drapes or something rather than put in hurricane windows uh, maybe make sure you have uh, foam in your attic so your roof doesn't blow. I mean, there's so many things people could do to beef up their existing house. And I just think people are, you're probably too young to remember the movie, The Accidental Tourist. Um, people are, I think they're accidental tourists. They just go around bumbling through thinking nothing's ever going to happen to them until it does. And then they try to find somebody to blame it on rather than say, wow, I could have fixed this because um, most people don't seem that interested. And I mean, that's understandable to me, at least. I think that it's really difficult to bring yourself to care about 
every single issue going on in the world at a deep uh, level or think it could affect you. I mean, I think we would be paralyzed in fear if we went that far. So that's really where policy has an important role to play. How do you either incentivize people to want to put in uh, those suggestions you discussed? How do we, uh, I guess you could say some sort of regulation or mandate to enforce it if it really is a very important thing for people to do? And that's the debate that we tend to have on the podcast, what policies could actually get this moving because as great as it is for people to understand these issues and take action individually, even just within climate change, there's so many issues that you can't possibly expect everyone to be aware of each and every one and how it will affect them. That's why I think it has to start at the bottom. I mean, I think we have to demand more because if I sit here and I go, well, I'm going to wait for them to tell me I have to have a safer house. My house could be destroyed 10 times over before I could get the knuckleheads downtown to come up with a plan. So I, I think people have to demand more. In, in Moore, Oklahoma, which we showcased in our, in our film, it took four major tornadoes for them to change the building code. And they finally did. And now houses survive, not the bullseye, but the houses to the left and right of the tornado where the wind isn't quite as strong. A lot of houses aren't damaged anymore. And the cost of that was the a builder told us the cost of granite countertops in your house. And he said, if people still had the choice, they would choose the granite countertops. And they got hit by four major tornadoes. I, I, after one, I would have said, okay, what do I do? I'll change. Yeah. I think people can absolutely demand more. You're right. Um, and I think that's a little different than expecting everyone to do a certain strategy because if you sort of, if again, if you expect everyone to do a certain thing, it's just not going to happen. There are going to be some people who don't want to do it, even if it's just to rebel against authority. But uh, very often there are actual pros and cons to these solutions where uh, a solution one person likes, another person might want to approach differently. Um, it can be at a much more basic level than that, but it also could be that. So I do think that um, obviously policy is never perfect and it's very difficult to not just get something passed, but um, carry it out and make sure it's effective. But that does have the most upside when it comes to making change at a larger scale. And so as an individual, you absolutely can kind of call whoever is uh, your representative, especially at the local or state level, they will listen to you uh, at the state level. If you've like 10 people call your state senator about a particular issue, they'll start to perk their ears up. So um, absolutely individuals can uh, play that role, but it to me is too much to expect that of every single person because there's just so much going on in the world to keep track of. Yeah, unfortunately, it usually takes a major disaster wiping out an area. But then uh, what we've found is they they rebuild to a standard that would not survive the same disaster if it hit them again. And the whole thing is just crazy to me. So, you know, I don't have the answer. I, I'm sure you don't have the answer either. What's the favorite podcast you've done? If there's one environmental topic that you would look at all the ones you've done, what's your favorite one? Well, that's like choosing your favorite child. That's <laughs> Of course, but I, I'm not going to name my favorite child now, but I certainly know which one aggravates me less than the others. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, well, I think, I mean, what I think is as the podcast has gone along, it's gotten better because we've just gotten more experienced. So I think I'll give my most eye-opening one and then one I would recommend to a first time listener. Okay. Um, for most eye-opening, uh, at least recently, I would say our chocolate episode really surprised me. Um, there's, uh, climate change certainly is affecting chocolate. Um, it's affecting its viability to grow in the regions where it is. Um, but what's happening in 
uh, Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, which between the two of them supply a majority of the world's chocolate, uh, these two relatively small West African countries, there's a lot of both the climate challenge, but also just the economic challenge of supplying chocolate to a very small handful of companies leads the price to be kind of pushed down in a non-economically uh, correct manner. That's just kind of what happens when you have an oligopoly. So it's led farmers to be making way less than they should be at their job, which has led them to kind of in desperation find ways to grow more chocolate and have more output so they can sell more. And that's led to two big issues. One is deforestation to find more lands to grow on. And the other is child labor. And again, it's really challenging to look at and say this isn't, uh, it's hard to blame it on the farmers when they're in such a difficult situation. Um, but that was a really eye-opening episode to me. And imagine trying to make that funny. Yeah. That was, that was something. We I'm going to have to go listen to that one script now. And we were like, why is this so sad? It's about chocolate. But yeah. that was, that was really eye-opening. One I would recommend to a first time listener, um, just off the top was our tropical cyclones episode, um, which covered hurricanes, cyclones, and typhoons, all different words for basically the same thing just happening in different parts of the world. And that was really cool. We interviewed uh, Susanna Camargo from Columbia University, who is one of the people who originally found the link between climate change and hurricanes. Um, so it was really cool to talk to her, hear about her journey and her research. And obviously that's an issue I think we're all familiar with a bit, but I kind of get into how the hurricanes actually work, how climate change affects them, because I don't know that people actually know why climate change is affecting uh, hurricanes the way it does. And then uh, it's not necessarily solutions to hurricanes, but we do talk about kind of how we move forward knowing that this is going to pose a much bigger challenge in the future. Interesting. Yeah, those are two I'm going to have to go listen to. I will definitely uh, check those out. What did, so you kind of live in the dream right now. What advice would you have for somebody out there who has an idea and they think, I can't do anything to move the world? What would you tell them to get them motivated? I think lean on your strengths and ask for help. Um, so think about some issue or what have you that you're passionate about. Uh, it doesn't have to be as big as climate change. It can be something just at the community level that's equally important. But I, I think in the world of climate change, a lot of the Gen Z voices are activists, which is really cool for them. Um, I went to a climate rally like freshman year in college and hated it. I can barely do loud noise in like a bar, let alone a rally. Um, so I just didn't see that as being for me. I also, like we've talked about, I have such a nuanced take on policy that kind of holding up a three word sign just didn't do it for me. But I was a writer. I was a storyteller. I was going into film and television. And I thought, how can I use that strength to uh, move the world? And that's kind of what I've done. I was writing for a while and then started this podcast, which just combined a whole bunch of my interests. Um, and then of course, asking for help. I could not have done this myself. I have a team of eight wonderful people that I work with on this podcast. And that's been a really great experience. So that's what I would recommend to people. Hey, maybe you'll be the next Bill Nye, the science guy with the sweaty penguin. That'll be, oh, a, there you go. That, that would be pretty cool. Just send the check for that uh, idea to me. Uh, my my inform <laughs> information's online. So anyway, Ethan, terrific stuff. I hope I encourage people to listen to the sweaty penguin. It's on all platforms. I imagine. Yes. Apple, Spotify, PBS.org, uh, wherever you get your podcasts, we're there. And then your website is www.thesweatypenguin.com. Awesome. Well, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for, uh, for coming on and continued success with the podcast. You're doing some great stuff. Oh, thanks for having me. This was a lot of fun. 
Thank you for joining me today. If you know somebody that you think might be a good guest, there is a contact form on my website, tellushowtomakeitbetter.com. And uh, just go on there, fill it out. I'll reach out to them and see if they are a good guest for the show. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you next time.